In October 1962, the United States and Soviet Union perched precariously on the brink of nuclear war. President John F. Kennedy and a new generation had entered the White House in January 1961. This was a time of deep chill in the U.S.-USSR nuclear superpower rivalry. Summit diplomacy between President Dwight D. Eisenhower and Premier Nikita Khrushchev had failed. Khrushchev negotiated with bombast and bluster, but he knew the Soviet Union was behind in nuclear weapons, and so he tailored his approach to the new president. The road Kennedy and Khrushchev found themselves on soon turned very rocky. In April 1961, the U.S. effort to oust Cuba's Fidel Castro in the Bay of Pigs invasion failed. And that June in Vienna, in their summit talks, Khrushchev measured Kennedy as weak and proceeded on three parallel fronts. He continued to build his nuclear weapons. He walled off east and west with the Berlin Wall. And he added to the Soviet military presence in the Americas to include plans for a submarine base off Cuba. Khrushchev proceeded on three fronts. He continued to build the Soviet nuclear arsenal. He mounted the Berlin Wall, walling off east and west, and he increased the Soviet presence in the Americas to include plans for a submarine base in Cuba. In the late 1950s and early 1960s, the U.S. Joint Chiefs, under the President, had a very crowded agenda. This was in a time of intense rivalry among the services between the Air Force and the Navy as new nuclear weapons were built and evolved. B-36s to B-52s, missiles in silos, Forrestal aircraft carriers with planes on deck ready to be fitted with nuclear weapons to launch, and the first Polaris ballistic missile submarines on patrol. President Kennedy had inherited strong Joint Chiefs, General Lyman Lemnitzer, who he would replace with General Maxwell Taylor, Marine Corps General David Shoup, Air Force Chief of Staff General Curtis LeMay, and Chief of Naval Operations Admiral Arleigh Burke, who would be replaced by Admiral George Anderson in mid-1961. When Anderson returned to the United States to become Chief of Naval Operations, he sensed unhappiness in the Navy in particular and in the nation as a whole over the failed Bay of Pigs invasion and he soon became aware that there were talks at higher levels on a regular basis to determine what could be done to redress the situation. In Cuba in May 1962, the Soviets had already introduced hundreds of tanks, hundreds of pieces of field artillery, jet fighters, and troops to support all of this growth. In late August, a U-2 camera flown by the U.S. picked up the first Soviet SA-2 surface-to-air missiles coming in. And as analysts studied this growth, there would be 500 SA-2 missile sites. They saw that they were there to protect valuable point targets. They weren't just arrayed along the coast to fend off some incoming attack from over the water. In mid-August, a U-2 photographed the first SS-4 MRBM ballistic missile convoy. Missile carrier and support trucks as they were pulling off the road under the cover in a wooded area. 
Two days later, another U-2, August 17, photographed an SS-5 IRBM site. The SS-4 MRBM could hit targets in the southern United States. The IRBM could hit targets at a range of 2,200 miles, almost anywhere in the United States. President Kennedy, with this information already known, proceeded with a long scheduled meeting with Soviet Foreign Minister Andrei Gromyko in the White House. And in that meeting, without tipping his hand about the discovery of Soviet missiles, he told Gromyko that the U.S. would not accept any offensive nuclear weapons in Cuba. Gromyko assured the president that any Soviet weapons entering Cuba were strictly defensive in nature. U.S. reconnaissance continued. Navy RF-8 Crusaders flying low-level missions, and we picked up more and more missile development and growth. It soon became apparent that the Soviets would have the sights in place for at least 50 nuclear missiles. At the White House, in executive committee meetings chaired by the President, two options were considered for responding to these Soviet actions. The first was a blockade of Cuba. The second was a military strike. The Joint Chiefs favored the military strike. Secretary McNamara and others favored the blockade. President Kennedy chose the blockade and in a speech to the nation on October 22, he decided to term it a quarantine rather than a blockade as he explained the crisis to America. On October 22, before his address to the nation, Kennedy met with the Joint Chiefs. And he told Admiral Anderson, the CNO, at the end of that meeting, Admiral, this is up to the Navy. And Admiral Anderson replied, Mr. President, the Navy will not let you down. Just before the President's address to the nation, Vice Admiral Alfred Ward, as Commander Second Fleet, ordered the ships to sea that would make up and support the quarantine. This was a powerful force. He told them in his initial orders, head south, course 160 toward Florida. Additional instructions will follow. The quarantine forces included the carriers Enterprise and Independence with their escort ships, the carrier Randolph, support ships, ships with some 25,000 Marines on board, and a second task force with the carriers Wasp and Essex and their escorts. By October 24, the quarantine was in place around Cuba and off the Bahamas to guard against any efforts to transit those Bahaman Straits. Admiral Anderson, looking back, described the Navy's posture, noting first that all of the Polaris submarines available were on patrol. He said the Navy had ASW patrol units scouring the skies, scouring the seas, looking for any incoming Soviet submarines. Soon, U.S., British, and Norwegian ASW picked up submarines heading south from Kola Bay toward the Atlantic. These were four Foxtrot submarines, each with 10 torpedo tubes, 20 torpedoes, and one nuclear torpedo. It was tough inside those submarines, getting hotter and hotter as they continued submerged into hotter tropical waters. The water was bad inside the subs. The air was bad. U.S. destroyers picked up the incoming submarines and began dropping practice depth charges on them. And it was hellish inside the submarines. The skipper of Foxtrot B-59 lost his composure and decided he would attack the U.S. Carrier Task Force. The Chief of Staff 
of the Soviet brigade was also on board the B-59, and he persuaded the captain not to attack, knowing that such a nuclear attack would launch an all-out war. The Foxtrot was forced to the surface, and for the moment, nuclear war had been averted. At the heads of state level, on October 26, Premier Khrushchev sent President Kennedy first one message and then another, spelling out Soviet conditions for withdrawal of missiles and offensive weapons from Cuba. He said the U.S. would have to end its blockade and the U.S. would have to promise not to invade Cuba. In his second message, he added another condition. The U.S. would have to withdraw its missiles from Turkey. On October 27, President Kennedy responded positively to the first Khrushchev message, making no mention of Turkey. In the event, the U.S. would withdraw those missiles. On October 28, Premier Khrushchev accepted President Kennedy's October 27 response. Work on the missile sites in Cuba, on the offensive weapon sites, the bomber sites, came to a halt. And withdrawal of those weapon systems and their support crews and equipment began. The U.S. monitored this withdrawal 24 hours a day intensively with surface-to-surface -surface ship inspections, air-to-surface surveillance, and reports from human contact. This continued through November and the crisis began to fade and would soon be over.